Hello, my name is Tim Shubish. Welcome to this video. Thanks very much for watching. The subject of this video is this synthesizer here, the Behringer 2600. Right, so I've had my 2600 now for almost three months, pretty much three months actually. I got it early in January. I paid for it with my own money. Uh, I pre-ordered it last year. Um, as you can see, it's sitting in a very posh looking case. It all looks rather nice, doesn't it? I'll talk about the case a little bit later in the video. Uh, obviously you, you get only this bit here in the middle <laughs> if you buy a 2600. Um, yeah, I've had it for a few months. And I've been sort of preparing to do a video for quite a while now. I've been putting together some music examples and some patch examples and trying to think about what I'd say in a video. And actually something has held me back from putting this video together and that is trying to figure out what this video should contain. Because I've noticed that there are more and more videos on YouTube right now about this synth. You know, there's a fair number of reviews, there's a fair number of people walking you through it, giving you sound examples. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm scratching my head trying to think, well, what can I do in a video that is kind of unique, that's different to the other videos? <laughs> and maybe I can't do anything that's unique, I don't know. Um, that's kind of sort, of sort of like stalled me from completing this video. And what I've finally decided to do is just give you my own personal thoughts on this synth. So this is not going to be a review. Um, you know, because basically I've never ever had the opportunity to, or the privilege, to own or play, uh, you know, an original ARC 2600. It's always been something completely out of my reach. They're far too rare, far too expensive. Um, I never got my hands on the Korg remake that came out, the limited edition uh, remake that came out. That was far too expensive and far too rare as well. Um, there are some other uh, very sort of like niche manufacturers that have come out with remakes of the 2600 over the years. Uh, again, they are very rare and they're quite expensive. Um, so the Behringer 2600 has been my first opportunity to get my hands on a 2600 remake and have that whole experience of using that iconic synthesizer because let's face it the 2600 must be the most iconic synth on the planet it really is one of the most iconic if not the most iconic it's instantly recognizable uh, all the great acts and musicians have owned them over the years they've appeared on so many great tracks so many great songs uh, it is an incredibly iconic thing and everyone just wants one but can't have one because of the cost and the rarity. And Beringer have given it to us here uh, for very, very little cost, I have to say. Uh, quite surprised at the, at the cost of these. So this has been my first experience in my whole life to sort of play with a 2600 kind of synth. And so what I thought I'd do in this video is kind of give you my thoughts uh, after three months with it about what I like about it, what I love about it, what maybe what I don't like about it, what I found frustrating or difficult at the beginning. Um, i just give you my thoughts because that's the only thing that I can do really in a video that's different to everybody else. <music>
Right, so my very first thoughts when I first unboxed the 2600, uh, wired it all up and started playing with it, is that it is actually the most modular of any semi-modular synth I've ever used. Um, I mean, I've used quite a few. I mean, Behringer, uh, they've come out with a lot of mono synths, and they're all semi-modular to one degree or another. You know, it all started with this one here, the Model D. Um, it's Eurac compatible. You can take it out, you can put it into a Eurac case and power it by the Eurac Eurorack case, um, and it's semi-modular because you've got all these patch points here across the top. Well, not, not that many of them, but you've got, you've got patch points across the top. Um, but they're almost like an afterthought, to be honest with you, because the, you know, the synth is completely self-contained. You've got all the controls you need, the dials and the switches, uh, to create whatever patches you need. You really don't need to go anywhere near these patch points or use them. And in fact, you know, most people won't be patching uh, the Model D or, or, or most of the other synths that, that Behringer has produced that are semi-modular. Um, here's another example. Uh, the Dreadbox, Erebus, Dreadbox uh, create a lot of um, semi-modular synths. Um, and this one here, you know, it is very semi-modular. It's got lots of patch points over here, lots of capabilities. Um, but it is a self-contained synth. You don't actually have to patch anything to use it. You've got all the controls, the uh, faders and switches that you need to create lots of wonderful sounds. You don't need to go near here. Now, that's not the case with the 2600. With the 2600 you really have to start patching it very soon after you start to use it. I'll just give you one example. Um, if you want to uh, choose a particular waveform that you want to listen to from one of your oscillators, well, on the Model D, you just turn a dial and choose a waveform. Um, on the Erebus, you, you just flick a switch. It's as simple as that. On the 2600, you actually have to pick up a patch cable and start patching it. You know, if I wanted to listen to the sawtooth, say, for oscillator number two, I might actually have to, to find the sawtooth output, stick a cable in there, and then this end of the cable has got to go into the filter section, uh, and one of these audio inputs will do. In fact, any of these audio inputs will do. I just choose any one I like, and then I turn up the attenuator to start hearing uh, that sawtooth coming into the filter section. Um, if I want to go into the filter section, or I could take it and put it somewhere else if I wanted to. You're going to have to patch it straight away if you want to start listening to different waveforms. Um, and this is not a negative thing. I don't want, don't want this to come across as being negative in any way. There is a lot of power in this synth. Uh, it is, it's very, very flexible and very, very deep, which is why it is such an iconic and lusted after uh, synthesizer. Uh, you can do an awful lot with it. But you've got to uh, sort of like, I think just your expectations if you're buying one is that it is, you know, this is different. It's going to work differently from more regular synths that you might be used to. Um, I think, if, you know, obviously if you're into Eurorack and you've got your own modular gear already, then it's going to be second nature to you. I mean, this really, the, the experience for me of using this synth is as close as possible to being like having a Eurorack case here filled with modules and patching them because what I've just done there choose a waveform and then plug it into the filter and then turn up the attenuator is exactly what you would have to do uh, with any kind of modular setup so it's going to be very familiar if you're into modular and if you're not into modular it might feel a little bit alien um, but that's, I, mean, I think that's a good thing I mean if you're thinking about possibly getting into modular at some point in the future then Patching this synth is going to give you a really good feel for what it's like because you're going to need to patch it. Whether those other synths I just showed you, you don't need to patch them at all. Um, and I think a lot of people do have semi modular synths and then end up not really patching them very much at all, if ever.
Now, while I've been playing around with the Behringer 2600, it has occurred to me how similar it might be to the original ARP 2600. Now, I'm not talking about the sound, that's a totally different subject. I'm talking about the capabilities, the facilities here on the front panel. Um, I, I think it must be a real dilemma for any synth manufacturer that's thinking about doing a remake of a, a classic, iconic, vintage synth. You know, how much do they stick to that original design? How much do they enhance it? What additions do they make? Uh, it must be very, very difficult decisions going on there because they're just not going to please everybody no matter what they do. Um, I was looking online uh, to see if there was a definitive guide to what's been added to the, the Behringer version that's not there in the original, and I couldn't find anything really. Um, so what I ended up doing was looking at a photograph of the front panel of a, an original ARP 2600 and comparing it. Um, so I'll, I'll show you, or I'll, I'll walk you through the, the, the main differences, the ones that I can see anyway, but it might not be every single difference. Uh, now let's just talk about the the form factor to start off with. It, it is very 2600-esque, you know, in terms of form factor, but the original ARP 2600 is a much longer, more elongated design. It's much bigger. It's got room for a couple of speakers on the front. Uh, those speakers are gone here with the Behringer version, which is absolutely fine by me. I don't see any reason to have speakers on a synth at all. Um, what Bering have done is they've chosen to use the standard rack mount width um, and, and have, have it with the rack mount uh, you know, holes in it. Uh, I think it's a really uh, clever idea by Bering. It means that there's a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of how you might want to mount the synth if you want to mount it at all. Um, but that does mean that it's a more sort of square design. It's a bit more squished in. There's less room between the controls. It's not a problem for me. Uh, you know, you can move these controls without knocking the ones on either side. No problem at all. Um, but it is a little bit more compact. Now, in terms of the actual capabilities and the features, the sliders and stuff on the front panel, there are some differences that I can see. Uh, let's talk about the oscillators to start off with. Um, now, on the original ARP 2600s, there's two flavours of oscillator, and it's the same here with Behringer. There's a simpler oscillator, like oscillator number one here. It's just got two waveforms, uh, sawtooth and pulse wave, and it's got a few uh, patch points on the front for modulating the frequency. And then you've got a more fully featured oscillator, like oscillator number two here. It's got four um, uh, waveform outputs. It's got triangle wave and sine wave added and it's got an extra CV input here with attenuator to modulate the pulse width. So um, this is the more fully featured one and the simpler one. Now on the original ARP 2600, there are two of the simpler oscillators and one of the more fully, fully featured ones, whereas it's the other way around here with Behringer. They, prov they provided us with two fully featured oscillators and one of the simpler ones. So that's a nice addition, a nice touch by Behringer. We've got more waveforms, uh, and therefore more flexibility in sound design. Uh, another difference that I can see here are these two switches uh, on both of the um, envelope generators. Uh, these switches here, sorry. These switches uh, are actually changing the timing of the envelopes. Uh, you can either half the timing to get some really snappy, punchy envelopes, or you can double the timing to get much, much longer, uh, slow attacks and decays than you otherwise would be able to. So that's a nice addition as well. I like that. Um, and the other major addition that I can see here is the LFO here down at the bottom. Um, now, there is an LFO with the ARP 2600, well, the later versions, I think, uh, but it was put into the keyboard rather than on the front panel. So it's replicating that functionality and putting it on the front panel, which is a very nice of bearing it to do. Um, it's, it's a nice fully featured uh, LFO. It's got triangle wave, it's got square wave, and it's got a sine wave. Um, and it's got a vibrato. And, and this was in the original ARP 2600 as well. It's just a very, very quick way of being able to add vibrato, some frequency modulation uh, to the... Um, to each of the, the three oscillators. So, as well as just regular vibrato, we've got a vibrato delay control, which delays the onset of the LFO. It's the same as what was on the ARP as well. You can get these lovely leads with it. Um, they provided a patch point here uh, so that you can then take that delayed sine wave um, and apply it as a modulation to anything else you wanted to. So you could do a nice delayed tremolo, that kind of thing. 
Um, and they've also provided an input here so that you can actually provide your own uh, waveform rather than use the internal LFO waveforms if you want to uh, to go through that same circuit. So that's really cool. Right, so there's a lot going on on the front panel of the 2600 and it can be a little bit um, daunting at first. Um, for me personally, when I started to look at it and try and patch it, I basically made the decision quite early on to ignore everything down here. You see this long line of CV and audio inputs that we've got here. I basically decided to ignore everything down here for the time being until I got familiar with what's at the top. Because what's at the top is the fundamentals of the synth. We've got the three oscillators, we've got a low pass filter, two envelope generators, amplifier section, and we've got the very nice uh, reverb uh, circuit as well up there. So everything down here to me is, is sort of like the more advanced stuff and I ignored that for the time being. I mean, you've got you know three oscillators, a low pass filter which in this uh, upper mode here is the original um, filter that was on the ARP2600 which is a copy of the Moog uh, ladder filter, 24 dB ladder filter. Um, so you really can make with this synth, you know, the big fat kind of Moog Model D kind of sounds if I turn up the three uh, oscillators together. Big fat sounds, you've got the, the filter as I said. But as well as that and, and having those three oscillators, I mean if you look at the patch points here, I don't think I've ever seen um, a synth or in fact uh, a Eurorack module with so many uh, modulation inputs to each oscillator. You've got four on each of the oscillators to modulate the frequency. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really sort of like shouting out for some frequency modulation. And with that capability and the fact that you can hard sync uh, oscillators two and three to oscillator one, you can just instantly make some really hard, dirty kind of sounds. Now when you start getting familiar with a 2600 and you start to get a little bit more adventurous with the kind of patches you put together, uh, you know, and maybe start to incorporate some of these circuits here down the bottom, uh, then what you'll find is that there is literally a lifetime of sound design capabilities in the synthesizer. I counted the number of patch points in total here. It's well over 90. That's a huge amount. I mean, really, just coming back to my original comment about 
uh, as close to modular as you can get without having uh, you know a modular rack in front of you that's what you have with this synth uh, there really is a lot of potential here I mean you're still going to hit upon limitations and sort of like brick walls trying to do something you know there's a circuit that's just you don't have like a, I don't know um, an attenuator which has a CV for example you don't have one of those there are things that you're gonna you know you're gonna find that you don't have so there's always some inventiveness required some sort of like thinking about workarounds and, and getting getting past the limitations but that's the same with any synthesizer to be honest with you um, what I'm going to show you now is me trying to utilize some of this stuff down here in my video on the Behringer 2500 series of modules uh, one of the patches that I came up with uh, with that set of modules was something I called birdsong. It was sort of like a recreation of kind of birdsong sounds, sort of the sounds you'd hear uh, with a dawn chorus in some woodland with lots of wild birds singing. Um, I'm going to try and recreate that on the on the 2600. Now, the 2500 uh, patch that I came up with was utilizing a sequencer. I don't have a sequencer here. There's no sequencer with the synth. Um, so I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to be using the sample and hold circuit a lot, for example, um, and the LFO, and, and try and come up with some kind of woodland bird song kind of sounds. So that's what's coming up next. When you do hear this on the video, I'm not cheating. I'm not doing any multi-tracking, overdubbing, uh, multiple, multiple recordings, anything like that. It'll just be one single recording of a patch playing out on the 2600. That's all you're gonna hear. Um, I'm gonna use a delay effect, but that's the only effect that I'm gonna be using. Everything else is the sound of this synth. As you get more confident with patching the 2600, you might start to think about uh, some of these circuits down here and, and what they do and how you might be able to utilize them. Now, I'm still learning this synth, uh, even after the three months, I'm still finding sort of ways of patching things that I never found before. Um, but I'll just give you a couple of pointers. I don't want to sort of like come up with a complete patch, uh, but just give you a few little ideas, things that I've discovered as I've been patching the 2600 uh, that you might want to incorporate in your patches. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is the sample and hold circuit. Now we all know what a sample and hold circuit sounds like. Uh, if I take the output from this sample and hold and modulate the frequency of one of the oscillators. 
you get that, right? We all know what that sounds like, and there's a very limited use for it. One thing that I like to do with Southern Hold, because I've discovered it has an external clock input, so you can override that clock that's going on there. And give it your own clock. Now, obviously, that clock could be an LFO or something else entirely. What I like to do with the sample and hold is actually give, as an external clock to it, the gate from playing the notes. Uh, over here, we have a gate output. If I take that, if you've got a long enough cable, and put it into the external clock input, now every time I press a key, it's a clock signal, individual clock signal, going into the sample and hold, which means every time I press a key, I get a random value. Um, so what I like to do then is to make it really subtle, not sort of like wild changes in pitch, but subtle changes in pitch. Uh, and if I do that and I introduce other oscillators, then I can get a real vintage vibe to the synth because I'm introducing sort of like on a per note basis uh, subtle detune effects. And you can make it as subtle or as broken sounding as you want to. Another circuit I like to use uh, next to the sample and hold is this little thing here. It's called electric switch. Um, it's basically got three patch points, A, B, and C. Now, either A and C are connected together, or B and C are connected together, depending on the state of this switch. As you see there, it's ping-ponging backwards and forwards, dependent on this little internal clock we've got going on. Uh, the way I like to use this is to apply a voltage, a fixed voltage, to one of these sockets up here, um, which then will give me a square wave LFO out of C. Let me demonstrate that to you. Uh, it's easier to do than to say. So we've got uh, a voltage processor section here where we can get some uh, voltages, fixed voltages, out of the synth. Uh, we've got a minus 10 volts and a plus 10 volts. Uh, we can go anywhere from 0 up to minus 10, or should I say down, uh, and anywhere from 0 up to plus 10. Now, both of these circuits are independent from one another, but they both have, at the end of them, an inverter circuit. So when I get my minus 10 volts, it actually gets turned into plus 10. So if I take the plus 10 out of here, and I put it into the switch A, slow it down a bit, now when the LED is on over on this side, then I'm getting plus 10 volts. And when the LED is over on this side, I'm getting zero volts. So I'm basically getting a square wave LFO. Um, but that LFO that I'm getting here is actually quite special. It's a unipolar LFO. It's going from zero up to 10 volts and back down again. Whereas a regular LFO, regular oscillator, is going above and below zero. It's called bipolar. Now, unipolar LFOs are really useful for modulating pitch when you want to set uh, the tuning exactly right. And let me give you an example of that. So if I take a cable and take this unipolar LFO and I'm going to modulate the frequency of VCO number three, which we're going to hear. I'm going to hold down a note and then start to turn up that modulation. very easy to tune it. And it's very easy to tune it because every other tone you're hearing is the actual note that I'm playing on the keyboard. I'm only having to, to tune one of the notes, the second note. Um, if I was to try and do that with a regular LFO, as I turn up the modulation, the pitch is going to go down and up at the same time. So I'm then going to have to retune the whole thing. It's a pain in the ass, whereas this is much, much simpler.
So that's a simple square wave, but actually we can get out of here more than a square wave. We can get something that looks a bit like a triangle wave. And to do that, I'm going to use this circuit down the bottom here of the voltage processor. It's called a lag circuit. Um, so if I take the output from this switch, oops, I need a slightly longer cable, output from this switch, and I put it into this lag circuit, and then from the lag circuit, over to modulate the VCO. Now what I can do is start to sort of like smooth out those changes in voltage. Actually, if you think about the square wave, I'm going to start turning those uprights, those verticals into slopes. And now we've got a triangle wave LFO. Right, so I think the time has come in this video to address the elephant in the room. And that elephant in the room is, well, does it sound like a real ARP2600? Uh, you know, it's the same elephant that walks into the room every time Behringer produce a remake of a vintage synth. There will be a very small uh, but vocal minority of people who like to sow the seeds of doubt, who will say, yeah, well, it might look like it, but it doesn't sound anything like an original ARP2600. The thing is, how do they know? Uh, how do I know? I actually have no clue. Um, because I don't have an original ARP2600 to compare it against. And how many people out there are going to have an original vintage ARP2600 and bother to get a Behringer 2600, sit them down side by side in a controlled environment and do some exhaustive sound comparisons? How many people are actually able to do that? Um, I don't think that very many at all. Uh, and they'll have to have a YouTube channel as well so that they can tell us all about it. So, I mean, that's the issue, is how do you know that a remake sounds anything like the original? And let's face it, if you were to sit down two original ARP 2600s side by side and play them, they'd sound different to each other anyway. After all these years, they're going to sound different. And this synth, even if it matched component to component those original ARP 2600s, is not going to sound like them because it's brand new. Give it 40 or 50 years and it'll sound exactly like, probably, a vintage uh, ARP 2600. Who knows? Um, at the end of the day, all I do is I draw comfort from the fact that Behringer got a guy called Rob Keeble from AM Synths involved. Uh, he has got 20 years experience of building analog modular synthesizers. He knows the ARP circuitry inside and out, the 2500 and the 2600. He was the lead engineer on this project for this product. He wasn't just a face that they used in some marketing material. Uh, he was the engineer on it. Uh, and I'm pretty sure uh, I trust the man that he did the best he could to get as accurate a sound as he possibly could given the constraints of modern components, modern technologies, um, and cost constraints, etc., etc., etc. So um, I'm pretty sure that it sounds very similar to an ARP 2600 or sounds very, very similar to an original ARP 2600 when they were first made. Can we say that? I don't know.
you know, at the end of the day, what makes a synthesizer sound like a synthesizer is going to be its oscillators and its filter. Predominantly its filter, let's face it, that's what gives most synthesizers its character. Here we've got a choice of two uh, circuits with the filter um, and the one that I like to use is the original which is you know a copy of a Moog ladder filter. Uh, there are so many synths out there now that have Moog ladder filters in them because you know the patents have expired and we can all copy them now if we like. Um, and it sounds like a Moog filter to me, it sounds great. Um, but I think personally what gives this synthesizer its character uh, and, and allows you to create 2600 style sounds is all the capabilities that you have here, all the sound sculpting capabilities, which is what a 2600 has. So really, if you want it to sound like an ARP 2600, then it's up to you to patch it, to utilize this stuff, learn it, engross yourself in it, and really have a great time and enjoy yourself using the synthesizer, because that's what it's here for. And I think that is the most important thing. So that's really what I have to say uh, on this in terms of sound. Uh, I'm sorry I can't give you a definitive comparison, but I think definitive comparisons are really kind of irrelevant anyway. Uh, it's up to you what you want to buy at the end of the day. Personally, I absolutely love this synthesizer. I really do. If you have got any gripes at all, um, my biggest gripe actually is the form factor. It doesn't really fit in uh, in my studio with the other stuff uh, that I've got. Out of choice, I wouldn't buy a synth of these dimensions, uh, but it is what it is. Um, oh yeah, I have got to mention that there is this case here as a gentleman on eBay. So if you search on eBay for um, Tolex case for Behringer 2600, you'll find him. He's just a one guy on his own, he builds them by hand, uh, so you have to be very, very patient with him um, and make sure you, you, know, you get an accurate estimate of how long it's going to take, because I'm sure he's got a big backlog of people wanting these things. But it's a fantastic case, it's got the handle on it and everything, um, and it's got a front which is not, obviously not here, so you can enclose it all up, you can carry it wherever you want to, I can take it with me on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was a great thing. Yes, it's expensive as cases go, but at the end of the day, it's a man who's made it by hand and that's the cost. Uh, anything I want to say here that I find a negative? Uh, just the form factor, really. Uh, it's, but it is what it is, right? Um, other than that, no, I don't have any negatives at all. I absolutely have loved my time using the synth. It was a little bit... Uh, weird at the beginning getting to getting used to it uh, but all i can say to you is just be patient uh see videos online you know check out how people are patching it a lot of the original patch ideas for the arp 2600 are obviously going to work with this as well um, it's really a synth to invest your time in you know for the money that it costs you can spend so many hours days and weeks and months losing yourself in here trying out different sounds um, it's it's worth it from that point of view, I think. So if this video is sounding a bit like an advert for this synth, that's just because I really do love it and I can find very little uh, bad to say about it at all. So that's it. That's my video. That's my video and thoughts on the Behringer 2600. Until the next video, as always, thank you very, very much for watching.